and let's start our first panel. Panelists, could you come on up and um, have a seat? And I will let Luis, who is your MC, um, do introductions. This is going to be 15 minutes from each speaker, though, and then we will open up for Q&A. And just a note on Q&A, we are going to have mics. Please line up behind the mics. If you have any mobility issues, please raise your hand and someone will bring the mic to you. And please, when it comes to Q&A, announce your name and organization. Okay. Water? Okay. Okay, okay you get to hear from me a second time, but I promise not to keep doing this. But um, I wanted uh, this first panel, uh, as, as I already mentioned briefly, is supposed to give us a bit of a frame of many of the issues that we'll be touching in greater detail throughout the symposium. Um, and so um, I won't go into, uh, we'll, we'll do this relatively informally, uh, and I won't go into great introductions about each one of these speakers. They'll be able to tell you who they are and, uh, and, 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 uh, and how they work. Um, but uh, it's a great privilege just to, I'll m just mention the names and, the, uh, and just a little bit of background. Um, uh, it's a great privilege to have, uh, I'll go in order of, of the way they speak. We have Rhiannon Price from MaxArt Technologies, and Rhiannon really uh, has, uh, has done a lot of work with OpenStreetMaps uh, community and their humanitarian efforts, then moved to Digital Globe, which is the precursor of MaxArt, and uh, I think was the director of their humanitarian effort, which has been critical in uh, coordination with many other stakeholders. Uh, particularly in humanitarian emergencies, and, uh, and is now at Maxar, which is the next iteration of that. So she's one of the world experts in understanding how uh, we're mapping the world in great detail, and you'll hear a lot about that from her. Then uh, we'll have uh, Katarina schneider Roos from Global Infrastructure Basel. They're a nonprofit out of Switzerland, where in Switzerland people know a lot about insurance and finance, as you might know. And so they work in that ecosystem largely to try to think about how to align the uh, funding of infrastructure uh, uh, with uh, sustainability and sustainable development goals in, in particular. So that will give us a bit of a perspective about how to think about money uh, and align that with a lot of our discussions. And then sort of a little bit the best for last, if I may, uh, we'll have uh, Mayor Yvonne Aki Sawyer from, uh, Sierra, from uh, Freetown, Sierra Leone, which has become really under, under the mayor's leadership, uh, one of the places in the world that's bringing together this, this entire agenda uh, and illustrating it with the situation uh, in the city, but also its vision. So we'll hear a lot about that, and I hope the mayor will give you a sense about all the things that we're talking about and how they come together in a particular context. Um, so what I wanted to do is just uh, open up with a few remarks that will frame this discussion and also interject a little bit the reason why, from our perspective here at the Institute, we wanted to have the symposium. So um, we've been, um, so let's see, the slides are on, so good. And let's see, I, so is the, so, so this is us. Uh, you can go to our website and learn more. But the idea is that we really are working, we're excited about cities because they're the places that increasingly are framing, you know, how we live, certainly in the 21st century. It's becoming a global human experience that wherever you live, people live more and more in urban environments. And they experience interdependencies, possibilities, and barriers that are somewhat similar, even though by different means throughout the world. But the most important thing is that, in some sense, the challenge, if we want to think about an application, is to think about these environments of, uh, environments of possibilities of transformation. But the challenge really is to create a different model of development that's more sustainable and closer uh, and more equitable. So um, I want to say just a few words about, we all know about this, but I, I'll show you a few pictures that, to me, are very compelling. So the first thing I want to say is sustainable development. Why cities? Why should we think about cities, right? And to me, this picture, which is a picture that I often use in my talks and other people use, tells, tells the story in one picture, right? So what you see there is Shanghai, right? And what you see there is 25 years. So 25 years, I want to emphasize this, is just about the right scale in time that we're talking about, right? We want to think about the policy uh, context of Agenda 2030, hopefully by 2030, but certainly in, in a time scale of about two or three decades, that we can think about a different way in which the world works. And the only environments we have that we've ever created that create changes this monumental and deep in a couple of decades are cities. Now, it is also true that this development, not to knock Shanghai or China, China has taken, through its model, but it's taken about half a billion people out of poverty in the last few decades, and that's amazing. Uh, but this development was not sustainable. As you know, China became the largest emitter in the process of developing. 
Um, and it's also not equitable, by and large. Uh, Chicago is worse than Shanghai, probably. But uh, just to say that this is not just about uh, Shanghai, it's about every city. We hope for doing better as we imagine in the future uh, and the present processes at play. So if you look at cities too, cities are the only sort of ray of hope when you look at sort of the climate uh, picture. As Chris emphasized, you know, we are uh, in what we are all now uh, calling a climate crisis. But if there's one place of good news, it's been this that just came out a couple weeks ago uh, during the C40 uh, summit which says that um, 30 of some of the world's largest cities have now declared that they've passed carbon peak. So as you know, 2020 is the year for climate where we, we have to, by most projections, uh, peak carbon and start decreasing carbon emissions. And this seems to have be happening already in 30 of the world's largest cities. So this is amazing. Chicago is one of them. So we're proud of that. But uh, you'll see many of your cities if you live uh, in Europe or uh, the United States there. But this, of course, is all rich cities, if you look at that list, right? So, you know, uh, if you look at the cities that really are developing fast, where there's growth, where there's sort of, uh, where we need a lot of infrastructure, none of those cities are in that list. So it's kind of, uh, it feels like we're pursuing this amount of progress, which is not to be, to knock it, but we we, we're being able to achieve this, this, this progress in a way that does not reflect what needs to be done in most of the parts of the world that are developing quickly. And I wanted to link these two things, because the fact that we're having a climate emergency is not all bad. It's partly because there is development in the world. That development, of course, has to be different in terms of resources of energy, but it's signaling that there is change, and that is a positive thing. So by addressing climate, which we tend to do in the global north, we cannot uh, slow down human development in parts of the world where that's necessary. And this is what makes the problem really difficult. Okay? So, and this is why we need neighborhoods. So let me make the point for neighborhoods, and there's sort of a little bit, uh, bear with me, uh, that I'll introduce from sort of history of ideas here. So I, I make this argument in three pieces. The first one is that the whole uh, policy of development that we've created, including the UN system and Agenda 2030, but also in the sustainability plans of every city, is about human capabilities. This idea that neighborhoods, places where people live, are where you know, our life is supported or not supported, with infrastructure, with services, with safety, with schools for the kids, all this stuff is necessary such that people can be creative agents at large. And so human capabilities are uh, grounded in how we live in neighborhoods. Inequality, inequity happens between neighborhoods. If you look at any city and you have any data or any information, you'll see there are rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, better serviced neighborhoods and not so well serviced neighborhoods. And finally, politics with capital P, as I already said, and institutions are formed out of people struggling and fighting for services and infrastructure and response. And this happens also locally. And this is very important and it's the basis for a lot of the community organization that many of you do. So this is where some of these ideas come from. This is a very old map of Chicago from the 80s and there are maps that go back a century. We've had data on neighborhood inequality in Chicago for 100 years. So don't think that data is just the solution. It's important that the data is created in a way that reflects uh, priorities for people and that we uh, track those and improve on those. But the idea, this is called neighborhood effects. It's the fact that in any city, but Chicago in particular, uh, different neighborhoods have very different characteristics. And uh, what you see here is a transition when Chicago deindustrialized and went from being a city that was doing well to a city that had a lot of unemployment and concentrated poverty and concentrated that poverty uh, along racial and uh, economic lines in some parts of the city, including the part all around you, except for the university. If you walk all around, you'll see that that's sort of the southern part of the, of the uh, map. So the neighborhood effects is generally something that you see in every city. So a lot of this uh, inequality is place-based and happens at the neighborhood level. This is what Chicago looks like today. It's still the legacy of 50 years ago. It has not changed dramatically. Even though every neighborhood has changed, the relative feel of what it feels for, for, to live in one neighborhood versus another has not. This is the same thing, but in different form. This is cities of South Africa. We've done this for Brazil and other cities. Uh, and this is access to services. It's getting a little bit better in South Africa. If you know the policy, some of you come from there. But as you know, it's very patchy. There are neighborhoods in uh, Johannesburg or Cape Town that have everything, and there are some that have very little. And that picture is really spatialized, and many of you that work in South Africa know that you know, much better than any of us. So I hope we'll discuss that. So this neighborhood picture is really how cities are organized and how really sustainable development happens and equity is expressed. Um, 
So why, so that's kind of the problem, right? So now let's think a little bit about the way forward. Uh, I'll make the claim, and I hope this panel will make, will make it clear as well, that we are in a different reality somewhat, a different situation, or at least there are ingredients, there are ingredients for hope. And, and those have to do, again, with three pieces, if I may. One is that, of course, we have a globally networked community, so we can be talking from Freetown and Chicago and Cape Town and every city on Earth. So we can learn from each other and be conscious of these issues. I think even this stuff about neighborhood effects is not conscious, that people don't realize that this is the way usually cities work if we're not conscious of these problems. The second one, which is transformational but brings both uh, great opportunities and problems, is data and information capabilities. So as you'll see, Rihanna will show us in part, and I'll show you too, we can know everything about the built environment in cities now, everything. So what are we gonna do with that kind of information? You know, how are we gonna use these awesome new powers for good and not for bad, right? This requires not only the data and information, but a lot of uh, thinking about public institutions and networks of people like us that actually promote and understand the uses of these uh, possibilities for good and for civic purposes. Uh, and finally, uh, we both uh, were mentioning this obliquely, uh, Chris and I, uh, we have the policy environment to do this. We basically have, uh, through the UN system, Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals and the Urban Agenda in particular, that allow us to think about a uh, program of development. And we have now, as you know, over the last few years, really a call for localizing the goals, right? Bringing those to the human scale. But we've not, I think, uh, been able to express exactly what that means. And as I'll show you, you can do this neighborhood by neighborhood. Every neighborhood can be part of the picture. So let me show you how this has changed. So I want to impress on you that we're in a very different situation in 2019 than we were a few years ago. So this is a report that put sort of the problem of slums on the map in the UN system. It's part of a report, a series of reports came out in two, uh, 2003. And this calls slums zones of silence, right? So for our friends from SDI, are they zones of silence? No, right? We know a lot about these places through the work of community organizations, but through work of many people throughout the world. So no longer zones of silence. This is the uh, Know Your City campaign from SDI that we also participated in terms of supporting them with uh, what are the right technologies to do this work. But this is really an example of a global network of people working locally but sharing methods, inspiring each other, and really creating something that demonstrates that you can have community organizations network to work globally. And I think that's one ray of hope that's very important. And the question is, you know, how do we do the, even more of that? And how is it that uh, community priorities, uh, local governments, possibilities are aligned in an agenda of, uh, of transformation? Okay? So this is another picture. It often goes, something that warms my heart in SDI, that knowledge is power. So you know, at university we like knowledge and we also believe is power. But we mean different things, but we mean some of the same things too. So the question is, you know, how do we use the kind of knowledge of the places where we live in and how they're articulated globally to make a difference? So let me just show you a few things that we've been doing. I think some of you have been seeing this map, but I want to show you this because it illustrates the issue. So this is a map of Nairobi. Some of you are from Kenya, and as you know, uh, Barak is sort of your cousin, <laughs> and so there's a connection there too. But uh, Kenya is a beautiful city. It's one of my favorite places, beautiful climate. The nature is amazing. And it's a very uh, interesting city, full of innovation, uh, really fast-paced. But you know, if you go to the center of Nairobi, so this is what you see now. We have all the footprints for buildings in most of Nairobi and increasingly most of the world. You see it looks like a city, it could be, you know, it's not as blocky as Chicago, but it's a city where you have streets and you have access to buildings and everything looks like the cities that you learn about in textbooks. But if you go to a different place, so this is Kibera, just to illustrate this with Nairobi, it's a very different city, right? This neighborhood effect in Nairobi, not in Chicago, not 100 years ago, but now. Uh, and what you see is this, right? So people live very densely. These are informal settlements. Uh, and people have no access to, uh, they don't have an address, they don't have uh, access to services, they're prone to uh, uh, humanitarian emergencies, they don't have access to an ambulance or a fire engine. And so a lot of the work we've been doing is try to understand and map these urban fabrics together with people that work in communities and to, uh, together with technologists to try to think about solutions that are different from what we had in the past. And they work with this fabric, but also change it and provide people with services. So some of the things we do is try to estimate the amount of streets that you'd have to add. This is just an estimate, don't take it too seriously. But it means that you, if for Kibera, which is fairly large, as you know, you need about 140 kilometers of new streets. And that starts putting sort of a numbers and 
and giving you a sense of what discussions we can have with the kind of technologies in places that we can have neighborhood by neighborhood everywhere. So that's a bit of the, tech, the context in which we are is essentially different from what we had before. And I just want to finish with a couple of numbers that take this local picture to the global scale. So after the last WOOF, uh, I was making already this point and the idea for the symposium, this kind of work was latent too. And I put together just some numbers, back of the envelope numbers, to give you a sense of the magnitude of the issue, both locally and globally. So based on some numbers from census and SDI communities, you, you can see that uh, basically there are about a billion people that really live in neighborhoods that are underserviced. If you can expand that number, if you are a bit more ambitious. But, uh, and it's typical that the scale of a neighborhood, the scale of community organizations is about 1,000 people. Uh, a few hundred families per neighborhood. So when you put those numbers together, you basically end up with this number, one million neighborhoods worldwide that you need to consider. So if you, you can decide for yourself if that's a scary number too big or if that's a manageable number too small. But you know, that's the kind of conversation that becomes interesting. But that means that even in the best scenarios, a basic upgrade of a neighborhood takes about two years to do. So if you, you know, string those along, you end up with two million years of neighborhood work that need to be done, okay? We don't have two million years, right? We have 10 years, maybe, maybe 20 if you go beyond 2030. But you know, this is completely disparate, right? So in some sense, what needs to happen is that uh, the second thing tells you about how much it costs, and this is a very rough, probably underestimate. But if you have 10 years till 2030, going to a 2030 agenda, and you do you know, 100,000 per neighborhood, that means 120 billion dollars, which is not a lot of money for worldwide budgets, but still uh, a year that need to be invested just in neighborhood upgrading. So that's the scale in money, but this means basically that you need to be working on many thousands of neighborhoods worldwide at the same time. And this is the opportunity here that we see, is that in many ways when we look at development, what's happening in all these neighborhoods, there'll be mistakes being made, there'll be improvisation, there'll be knowledge, there'll be different, different parts of the world. There'll be a different way of working because you're mostly working with existing you know, fabric and people living in places. And so there's a need for people to be networked, not only in their work locally, but in all the knowledge, financing, technology, and things that will enable this work to work, to exist, and to be fast. So what we're calling for in some sense is uh, this idea of what we call a million neighborhoods, which is the idea that we need to find ways to integrate all these ingredients together and enable sustainable development that's human-centric, that it speaks to what communities need, but at the same time uh, puts those communities in the context of their cities, of their governments, and creates um, institutions and creates um, um, solutions that are appropriate to context, but also are a source of inspiration and learning for people working in different parts of the world and can also receive kind of knowledge that's being developed in different places. For me as sort of an academic, for people in technology and other stakeholders, even the UN, we need scale in order to be able to actually work with each community. And at the same time, I think communities need a scale of uh, uh, international organizations, meetings like this, and also other stakeholders in order to do the best work that they can do at the scale they can do, and often to advocate for their own basic rights, ba basic rights of tenure and development that need to be there in most cities that don't exist by local institutions. So that's more or less sort of, the, sort of the framing concept for a lot of what we hope we'll do here, is to essentially ask how is it that we bring these new ingredients to think about sustainable development in every neighborhood on Earth, that we now know where it is, we know what it looks like at some level spatially, we know what it looks like socially through the work of many of you, but uh, we have to take in some sense that characterization and diagnose forward into a picture of change that's positive change. So thank you. So with that, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, which is um, Rihanna, and she will, uh, I think, uh, blow your mind a little bit with what we can do with this kind of data and what uh, they are doing. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, hopefully I meet that expectation. Thanks, Louise. Uh, <laughs> um, as Louise mentioned, uh, my name is Rhiannon Price, and I lead the sustainability and humanitarian work at Maxar Technologies, formerly Digital Globe. 
Um, so what we do, before I kind of jump in, is we own and operate a constellation of Earth observation satellites. So in terms of what we're collecting, this is, I think, is a really good representation of, of the kind of data we have access to. So this, this kind of graphic just represents the depth of our imagery archive in terms of number of images we've collected over these areas of the world since you know, the early 2000s when we first launched our, our, our first satellite. Uh, so just to give you a sense in terms of the coverage here, it's immense. And we're collecting 3 million square kilometers of imagery every day across the world. So it's huge data. We've got over 100 petabytes of, of imagery already collected. And this is imagery that's obviously not just over, over terrestrial areas, but also over oceans, right? So it does beg the question of where do we focus those sensors, knowing that this is only just from one constellation, to be fair. Um, but these are really heavy data, and we have to be uh, intelligent in terms of where we're focusing. And so what that means for us, at least, is we tend to focus on areas where we expect change, where we expect um, the dynamics to, to show things that are interesting. Um, so this is an example of one of our images over Auckland, New Zealand. So this is a 30 centimeter resolution image. So you can at least get an appreciation of the level of detail that you can see from, you know, 350 kilometers uh, up. And it's really incredible. One, in terms of the, the richness of the individual containers, you can tell the kind of vessels that's there. A lot of times you can tell um, what it's transporting, how many cars are around, et cetera, et cetera. But not only can we take pretty pictures like this, we can also start to do really exciting modeling and, and, and moving into away from 2D, 2D into 3D. So this is just an example I grabbed from Chicago where we're taking what we call kind of off-nader uh, collections over cities and stitching them together to create these really incredible, rich, um, interactive uh, examples in terms of what cities are. And, and of course, this is not just um, you know, fun data. I'll, sh I'll show you a couple examples here. Um, this isn't just data for fun, right? This is, this is for urban planning. This is for um, an immense amount of use cases, which I'll talk about. Um, but having not only the kind of horizontal footprint of a city, but also the vertical footprint of a city is, is really incredibly powerful. And so I want to talk about, oh, uh, use the wide ones. Um, so I want to talk about this idea of kind of an urban sustainability baseline uh, and where these data are, particularly in terms of kind of emerging technology and what we can create already today. Um, so I'd like to focus on a number of layers around what Luis was calling in terms of this built environment, right? We can map everything. We can do building footprints. We can do roads. We can do heights and, and so elevation models. We can do land use, land cover, and, and really understand um, how folks are actually putting the, the built environment to use. But on top of that, once we had those baseline data, which, which again can, can solve for a myriad of different use cases and questions, we also have the ability to then do smart monitoring over areas, particularly because those baseline data are going to help us, to my point earlier, further target where we put our limited resources. Um, so even within a city where we know we want to consistently image, where are those areas within a city where perhaps we want to monitor for large infrastructure projects, or where we have a disaster happen, where we need to have real-time information in that aftermath to hopefully respond more quickly and more intelligently than we could otherwise. And so what we're trying to do is not only take all of these immense pixels that we have and all that incredible data, but as our founder likes to say, get that j data out of jail. Um, so of all, all of that noise, distilling the signal out of that, a lot of it for us comes to artificial intelligence techniques, crowdsourcing techniques, as, as Luis mentioned. Uh, and particularly within AI, I think machine learning has been a huge boon in terms of being able to extract information from satellite imagery at scale. And so part of what we're doing is, this is an example from our first countrywide extraction of building footprints against imagery, where we essentially stitched together hundreds of, of image strips to create a kind of seamless mosaic over an area. So it's within the same season, it's, it's kind of consistently um, um, displayed, and so it's ready for machine analysis. Then we can run our machine learning models against that to then extract those data. So that's what you're seeing here um, as number two is that actual extraction. 
And then last but not least, of course, we do quality checks. So especially for a lot of the use cases we, we initially supported, which were in kind of the global health realm, we needed to hit really high thresholds of accuracy because if we didn't map a certain household, it was likely that perhaps a vaccine wasn't distributed or that household didn't get sprayed for malaria, et cetera, et cetera. And so we do really rigorous quality checks to make sure we meet at least a, qual a threshold in terms of kind of precision and recall uh, of about 90% over those areas. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a wide variety of use cases that just those types of data can support, things like uh, buildings and roads. And there's also a really diverse, I think, set of stakeholders that are tapping into those types of data. So these are just some of the examples in terms of some of the organizations we've been working with on those types of data and, and kind of machine learning projects in particular. Uh, but you can see here, it's everything from some of those global health use cases that I mentioned, um, agricultural development in terms of understanding access to services and resources. We've done a lot of that work in terms of the context of smallholder agriculture. Um, starting to understand the nexus of things like health in the environment, doing that with partners like Jane Goodall Institute, PATH, and others. And so it's just an incredible list here. Um, and this is, I think, just the beginning in many ways because it's, it's a little bit, um, especially in, in terms of kind of emerging technology, we don't know what we don't know yet. Uh, and I think as a technologist, what I'm particularly excited about is getting this data into the hands of folks who can really make those pixels dance and, and, and make those data meaningful for communities. And so just to give you an example in terms of the Tanzania extraction that I mentioned, so this was in uh, a little bit over a year ago when we, when we first did this with um, support from the Gates Foundation. Um, and what we did, like I said, is mapped um, all of Tanzania. So it's nearly a million square kilometers that we were stitching together. It took the entire project of that kind of mosaicing piece and the ML piece, uh, it took three weeks total to complete. We extracted over 18.5 million building footprints in that time period, and our accuracy was 95%. So just incredible in terms of the scale of what you can do, and especially when I juxtapose that with uh, the uh, OpenStreetMap community and, and a lot of what communities are doing, this to me is so exciting because it unlocks all of those community folks to be able to do things that are much more exciting than tracing ability on a satellite image or going out with GPS and trying to record locations. It means that they can start attributing this data, they can start using the data for decision making, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that too. So where do we go from here? So last year we mapped, um, with support of various kind of donors and government partners, we did um, Tanzania, Sierra Leone, Mozambique, South Sudan, Somalia, a lot of sub-Saharan African countries. We've obviously um, also done some, some more uh, developed countries in the US and Australia and, and, and others, um, but this is really where we're going. And, and, and the intent now is to map every single uh, country within sub-Saharan Africa for building footprints and for roads and to publicly release that data. Um, again, to this point of we as technologists only understand the value so far, we, we can start to guess of how folks will likely use the data. Uh, but I think it's gonna be incredibly powerful when we, when we are, start to open that up and, and really see what communities can do. I think there's also this idea of maps on demand that's, that's coming on online more and more. Uh, particularly, you know, we partner a lot with companies like Facebook, uh, where they're also really um, integral in terms of the OpenStreetMap community, as are many others, um, for good business reasons, but also because they see their technologies as having a social good component, as do we, of course. And so I think for that, it's really interesting to think of how can we create maps on the fly with things like machine learning, uh, particularly in those emergency context where we need actionable information and we need it quickly. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to one example of that. Uh, we're also doing a lot when it comes to actually pinpointing change and then trying to do more in terms of predictive analytics. So you can think about once we have these baseline data and we move into that monitoring phase, we can essentially understand what are the growth rates in cities over time because we'll have these building footprints. We can appreciate how quickly the built environment is changing. Um, and then we can also start to do more tailored analyses on those areas that are changing. What are the drivers of change? Where do we forecast this? What are some of the scenario planning that we can do? Data fusion is gonna become more and more kind of the, the core of, of what we do. And, and when I say data fusion, I mean, by that I mean really linking disparate data sources and disparate data sets around this idea of, of location. 
And I think that's where geospatial data in particular is, is a huge help in terms of not only kind of tying data, a building footprint to a place, but understanding um, where your survey data comes in, understanding where perhaps social media data comes in or all of these different, different use cases. Um, that example that you're seeing here with the less equal, more unequal, is just an example of a project that we did with UNICEF where we were taking not only kind of features derived from satellite imagery, but also call detail records from cell phones, from cell towers, so that we can actually disaggregate mobility of women and girls from boys and men to understand for urban planning purposes, you know, what, what are we learning? What, what can we evaluate? Because those are data that had never really come together in, in, in such a kind of uh, question frame and an analysis frame before. And so there's really incredible insights that came from that pilot that could then be potentially replicated uh, across multiple cities. This was just for Santiago. Um, and of course, unlocking domain expertise. I think there's one thing in terms of kind of the community level, um, but it's also, I think, in terms of kind of from a satellite imagery perspective, most folks are not used to working with um, these kind of pixels, right? Uh, you're not an imagery analyst, you might not be a remote sensing specialist, uh, but a lot more folks understand GIS, uh, understand geospatial data, um, can marry that with tabular data and other forms of, of insights. And so I think moving kind of down that data value value chain and where ML can actually help us you know, get more data out of these pixels and unlock more insights means that we can open it up to a much broader community of users as well. This is just one example I wanted to showcase in terms of when you have that baseline data, what it means for communities. Uh, so this is just one example. This is from the US actually where we do a lot of kind of wildfire response. And so we have, for the US, already extracted all of the building footprints, so we could actually take that and then couple that even just with our own data assets, so other imagery, to actually see hot spots of where fires are burning most intensely, which communities, which homes in particular are at risk, uh, where potential ingress and egress routes are in terms of evacuations and safety planning. And so this is just one example of that. So what you're seeing on the left is just the, the vector data that we extracted from the imagery. In the middle, what you're seeing is our shortwave infrared. It's a specific type of imagery that allows us to see through smoke, allows us to pinpoint some of these types of data. And then on the uh, right there, what you're seeing is the actual kind of merging of that data so that we can pinpoint which homes are at risk. And so for California and a lot of you know, communities in Colorado where I'm from and others, this kind of data is, is mission critical. Another example in terms of kind of the domain expertise piece is um, some of what we've done in terms of just fostering this community around ML and using these data sets. This is just one example of uh, partners of ours that are called Green City Watch. So they're um, a social goods startup focused on really understanding quality of green space in cities. And so what they do is not only map kind of built environment, but they're also trying to understand um, more social questions in terms of how are people using parks? Um, what does it mean in a, in a city like Jakarta um, to be able to have green space? And what does it mean for quality of life? And so they've started to foster this idea of urban green prints and, and what that means as well, and have taken it in a direction that we as a satellite imagery company would have never thought about. This is one example from the Jakarta work that they're doing in terms of, again, just running machine learning classifications against satellite imagery to understand, even within a park, what are the kinds of uses that you're seeing there? Um, how much water is there? How many uh, roadways are there? What are they used for, et cetera? And of course, this idea of, to go back to kind of this thread of you know, marrying the kind of community level with what we are able to do at a really a global level and, and at scale is this idea of kind of high tech meets low tech or high, te high tech meets analog, right? And so I think uh, I'll talk to this and, and kind of close on this idea uh, around a project that I think is really powerful, especially uh, perhaps a model that we could emulate. Um, but it's this idea of taking what we have, whether it's from space or otherwise, and, and, and bringing it to a level that people can appreciate. And, and in a lot of cases for us, that could be printing off satellite imagery, which you know, for technologists is kind of wild. <laughs> you lose a lot of the value of, of the pixel. But for communities, it can reorient their perspective to be a spatial one. And it's so powerful when you start to see that, when you start to see even kids understand what their surrounding geographies can mean and, and how they can influence it. It's, it's really powerful. 
Uh, I'd also say that I, I don't, I don't want to totally eschew crowdsourcing. So as Lush mentioned, you know, we're active in the OpenStreetMap community. Um, I think that is an incredible way, one, in terms of kind of open source and, and making sure communities have access, but also kind of a really a living map that communities can contribute to where we can put um, homes and, and communities on the map that really have never been mapped before in many cases. Um, but uh, crowdsourcing is also an opportunity for us to kind of reinforce what we're doing on the machine learning side, um, but then also, of course, enhance it and do all sorts of things that perhaps machines aren't good at yet. Um, so with that, I'll just show a, a couple quick examples before I wrap here. Um, these are just some of the examples that we took over Turtle Bay in the Bahamas uh, before and after where we were working with communities there um, to respond uh, after Dorian. Um, and so you, again, you can just see the level of detail between what I'll call kind of a, a baseline shot on the left or a pre-event image to really what we were able to capture of the destruction and what those communities actually faced. And, and so not only do we take that, but then we do things like damage assessments using crowdsourcing on the fly, because then we can tailor our approach to what the Bahamas need. Or we're doing things like extracting where all the street lights are, because then we can understand which communities are have electricity or electrified or have street lighting, et cetera, um, and can pinpoint where the gaps are. Uh. I'll go kind of quick. This is just an example from, from Mozambique, um, from the also disaster response in terms of the cyclone, taking building locations and putting them on, on top of flood map layers. Uh, we partnered with a number of organizations uh, there in Mozambique uh, to actually you know, put the data to, to use right away, because this is, again, data that we had extracted for global health purposes, but was put to use for, for disaster response. And last but not least, I want to close with a, a project that I think is a, is a great way to kind of encapsulate a lot of these ideas. Um, this is some examples from a, a project called Romani Haria, which in, in Swahili means open map or free map. Um, so it's a project focused primarily in Dar es Salaam, where they're essentially taking this really incredible stack of technology, satellite imagery, um, street views, GPS, um, they're doing a whole bunch of other cool sensors too on bajajas and things like that. And what they're doing is they're actually giving that and training uh, community members to go out and enhance those maps and create really detailed localized maps of their neighborhoods. And so this initially was, was a project from the World Bank and, and Red Cross and Humanitarian Open Street Map focused on flood resiliency. And, and so I think there's a really great climate thread there too. But the cool thing of this is not only did the communities own and create these maps and have since continued to keep them uh, updated, but they've also used them for all sorts of other different purposes. Uh, one of which is in one of the communities in Tendali, there was a cholera outbreak. And, and so they were able to actually use this data uh, for health purposes and, and the community did that. It wasn't even the you know, local kind of political leadership, it was community members doing that work. And so again, I think um, the it's, it's an exciting time, as Luis mentioned, in terms of there's, there's a real, I think, value from AI and from satellite imagery where we talked a lot of hype for a lot of years, but I think right now the rubber's meeting the road and, and there are really incredible data sets for, for folks like you, but also um, communities around the world to take advantage of as well. So thank you. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and so honored to be here. And I, I just want to take the opportunity to, to thank uh, Luis and Annie to invite me. Um, uh, it has been such a collaborative atmosphere already starting yesterday. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, Global Infrastructure Basel uh, is a foundation in Switzerland. We are not, you know, like uh, the insurance industry <laughs> or a uh, financing body. <laughs> Um, working with them, um, and we work in the space of uh, sustainable and resilient infrastructure. So our mission is to make infrastructure generally more sustainable and resilient. So um, our idea is then how um, can infrastructure play a role in localizing the SDGs, not just to the city level, which is uh, a, a form of lo localization, but really to the project infrastructure level. And um, my key messages here would be today that um, sustainable infrastructure is a key instrument to uh, implement the SDGs, uh, a very concrete uh, way to do that. 
Um, however, there are financing gaps, and there, there's a quality gap. The infrastructure we have doesn't always have the quality we want it to have, and the infrastructure we are lacking, we are not uh, able to afford it. So um, we think that it needs standards, um, and that they play a role in, in achieving both of these elements. Um, we have a standard, we have developed a standard, it's called SURE, the Standard for Sustainable and Resilient Infrastructure, and it has been a long journey. We have developed that over three years with um, a multi-stakeholder dialogue, um, including about 50 organizations, uh, including the World Bank, city networks, for example, the city of New Orleans has been participating, um, the city of Trane, uh, the big engineering associations, private investors, the development banks, the OECD. So we had a very big uh, stakeholder engagement to do what? To really identify what actually is sustainable and resilient infrastructure. There were so many opinions out there. So we, we led that process in defining a set of indicators and criteria and there was a consensus-based decision after three years on those criteria. So that, that's what we tried to do over these three years. Um, and um, what, um, so what is the problem? Obviously, uh, where we stand, we need to do now more and faster. So we, we, we need to do so much faster, all these things. And we hope that the SURE standard can be a, a contribution in, in implementing the the agenda 2030. I mean, the population is increasing. We've heard all the numbers. Uh, so where, where will they live? Where will all these people live? Uh, where will their water and energy and job opportunities come from? Uh, everything we are trying to achieve with the SDGs relies on, on, on functioning infrastructure. Uh, linking people to jobs, providing opportunities, providing water, energy, and materials needed for economies and communities to flourish, or at least survive. And uh, this infrastructure has to be built for the future. That means it has to withstand climate change. It has to be adaptable. It has to withstand and recover quickly from disaster, and has to avoid a lasting negative impact that it causes because it also causes negative impact, obviously. It causes pollution. It causes um, displacement of people. Um, it causes uh, GHG emissions. And um, it uh, can lock in um, unsustainable development if it, done, if it is done in the wrong way. So finally, it needs to be inclusive. Um, infrastructure cannot just service the rich there's actually a much greater need for uh, um, poor, for underrepresented groups. However, the financial structures uh, we operate under do not direct uh, investment to where it is most needed. Um, this leads to the next point. Um, the lack of finance. So cities need to mobilize capital at scale um, because cities are, are the engine of global economy, accounting for 80% of the global GDP. Um, the populations are rising. Urbanization is, is uh, very fast, uh, growing very fast. And on the other hand, uh, cities consume two-thirds of the total energy, and they're responsible for 70% uh, of the CO2 emissions. So we need to act and focus here if you want to meet the SDGs. Um, well, it's not only about um, quantity. It's really about the quality of the infrastructure project itself. Um, to build infrastructure is very costly. We lack uh, the money. Um, there's a lack of about $1.2 trillion a year in infrastructure building. At the same time, the kind of infrastructure we are currently building is sometimes not what, what we really need. So in many ways, the infrastructure is built 
that is not sustainable, that is actually even not needed uh, in the way it is built. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've assessed about 200 projects worldwide with our sustainability tools. We've also you, done um, summits to introduce them to investors. So it was a very uh, big learning curve on our side also to understand, um, or, or we try to be a, a, a matchmaker between sustainable infrastructure projects globally and investors. Um, so, um, on the, so, and, and after, during this process, assessing all these 200 projects and having these discussions with investors, um, we also learned a lot about um, matching the, the needs of investors and the needs of cities, because uh, we were very naive in the beginning. We thought, ah. Oh, there's all these great projects, so let's do a summit and just bring them together with investors, and then they, they just you know, do a showcase, a mix, they'll, they'll find the projects, but that's exactly what the problem is. Um, you know, certain investors invest in certain phases of projects, in certain sectors, in certain um, regions, or do not invest in certain regions uh, and sectors because of the risk profile of the project. So, um, by having a standard which certifies a certain project, uh, you can reduce the risk of the project and uh, give the investor a better understanding of the risk return profile of the project. So we had to learn the investor's language in translating sustainable infrastructure into investors' terms. Um, so when it comes to quality with sustainable infrastructure, there's an alignment with best practice and technology. When we do develop the standard, we used about 30 existing uh, standards and frameworks uh, to uh, integrate them to our standard. We translated the SDGs and referred our indicators or criteria to the SDG indicators. We uh, re reflected the sender risk reduction framework. So we tried to do all that. Um, with the quality infrastructure, you avoid locking, and uh, you can anticipate uh, future requirements. So how would that attract finance? Um, on one hand side, you can unlock um, green and development finance. If you use that uh, language, you can um, leverage conventional finance, and you can also um, establish um, asset class characteristics. The infrastructure asset class discussion has been going on for a while. The, the, it has been defined, and we also try to add sustainability aspects to that discussion. So um, what would an investor, which kind of profits would an investor have from a more sustainable or resilient infrastructure? He would know, he would have lower risks because of um, a better value chain the stakeholder engagement would be clearer. Uh, there would be an improvement of reputation. You know, investors want to have um, also, they're also aware of climate change. Uh, they want to um, use the CSR models. Mm. Um, they would foster resilience. So the systems would actually able, be able to survive. Um, there are numbers from the World Bank that say that every dollar you invest in resilience up front would save you $4 uh, along the life cycle. Um, then these projects uh, are adapting uh, to regulations uh, so that they can avoid fines and penalties. That's uh, as, as a cost-saving mechanism. Um, and it can increase revenues. Um, so what do, you do, what do we do with Sure? Uh, we provide investors a very clear uh, understanding of the ESG, so environment, so social and, and government criteria of their projects. And um, we have a, a third party certified system behind the standard which means we are not certifying, we train certifiers around the world. 
who are then able to certify projects and can give that data uh, for investors. Um, and uh, we're trying also to create some innovative financing models around the sure standard. For example, um, one example would be we did a, um, a review of our sure standard and we are adding a child-friendly perspective to it, which means we are trying to see how infrastructure can actually uh, affect children in a positive or negative way. Negative would be around the construction site, um, for example, with uh, child labor, or how children could be posit positively affected by the services of infrastructure, obviously education, electricity. So um, we're trying to create a sustainable impact bond around these uh, monitoring processes, uh, and we use the, the, the sure assurance system to do that. Another example of how we use the sure standard to um, communicate with investors is uh, we aligned all the other sustainable infrastructure standards because investors very often say, ah, we don't really know what is that is sustainable infrastructure. You know, how do you define that? And are you the real standard? You know, there's so many standards out there. Um, so we decided, oh, you know, it took, took me two years to bring all the other standards together to one table and say, oh, let's collaborate. If that's the problem, um, uh, let's get together and compete and collaborate at the same time. So we developed a set of aligned <laughs> indicators. You know, it's very technical, but it's, it's very important for investors in a way to say, oh, we all agree on this definition and we all report to the same indicators. Um, then we can actually compare projects on the sustainability performance. And at the end, if you have a data um, base on with all that information, we can compare the data that we got through the sustainability assessments with the financial performance. So the whole idea of that collaboration is to uh, get a data set that finally is convincing for investors to say our oh, sustainable and resilient infrastructure uh, performs at least the same or even better than conventional infrastructure. This data hasn't, that doesn't exist yet in a very convincing way. So we're trying to, to make a point there and we are supported by the World Bank uh, and other MDBs to do that. So I hope that really <laughs> makes a, a, a difference there on a larger scale. And um, uh, thank you again for being here. And um, I guess we're going over to the discussion. So we now get to hear from Mayor Freetown. Uh, how does all this play out in your context? Great. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to be here, um, particularly because of the work that the Institute is doing in Freetown. And as Lewis has said, and as Chris has said, um, in my role as a mayor, all of this comes together in a really practical way. What does it mean to have communities engaging in development? What does it mean to have the city working towards the implementation of the SDGs. Ultimately, what is it that we're trying to achieve in an integrated way, where financing is a factor, where availability of data is a factor? I have been a mayor now for a year and five months. I keep checking. <laughs> and I came into this space from a non-political background. I'd never been in the public service, I'd never been in politics, but I was deeply concerned about something that was affecting my city, and that was the environment. So that was my driver. So nine months before the general election, I threw my hat in the ring, um, and thankfully, I won, and became the first elected female mayor of Freetown, with 60% of the vote. Go women. This morning, I'd like to just share with you how all of this comes together um, and the challenges that we face 
and how together with the work that you're doing, the discussions that we're having, my, the work in my city and work in other cities can be enhanced by this conversation. So, transform Freetown, an integrated and inclusive approach to urban development. Oh yeah, I have to do this myself. Okay. <laughs> right. So a little bit about my city. Um, we've seen substantial urbanization. Chris discussed or mentioned the figures um, from 2000, from the 80s to 2000s to today, and where we're looking at in by 2050 on a global level. And this has also been very real in our context um, in Freetown. A big in driver initially was the Civil War that happened and ended in the early 2000s. And it meant that the city I grew up in with about 500,000 people became a city of a million plus people by the end of the war. Today we're at 1.2 million, and the estimates is that we're going to grow, continue to grow at about 4.2%, taking us to about 2 million people by 2028. That puts enormous pressure on the city. Um, it puts enormous pressure on the infrastructure. It also puts huge pressure on the landscape, on the natural environment. And it was that pressure that I was responding to when I made my decision to run for office. So we're a really dense city, 845,000 people per square kilometer, up there with some of the most dense cities around the world. And our geography is such that we've got the Atlantic Ocean, we've got a range of mountains, and a narrow plain. So there's no room to grow other than up the hills or into the sea. And when growth happens in an unplanned manner, it's a very dangerous thing. So what we've seen with this rapid urbanization, and I know there are a number of you here from SDI, um, and unfortunately my colleagues from SDI were not able to come, so I'm representing SDI. Knowledge is power. power. So that community, because of um, this pressure and the growth, the rapid urbanization, and the lack of planning to absorb those people, we've ended up with 68 informal communities in Freetown over a very short space of time. And currently, about 35% of our city's population live in those informal communities. So as a new mayor, and in fact as a mayoral candidate, that community was very important for me. And I engaged with the SDI, with FERDUP, as ours is called, um, during my campaign. And when I won the election, they were the first group of people that I sat with even before I was sworn in. Why? Because the challenges that we see in Freetown are most acutely felt by those people, people living in those communities, but also because people living in those communities have to be a part of the solution. So what we have is not only from them, but across the city, growing demand for services, um, for homes, for access to healthcare, education, as everybody would have, as every individual desires. But because of a lack of planning, this has happened, the communities themselves um, have emerged, have been established in areas of vulnerability along those mountain slopes where deforestation has led to major natural disasters, but along the, the coastline as well, where the banking of our mangroves have led to a reduction in biodiversity, um, which in itself reduces fish populations um, and consequently makes our oceans polluted, all of which makes life more difficult for the very people who are already vulnerable um, because the cost of fish, which is a protein for 65% of our population, goes up as that fish population goes down. And that's just one of the impacts. A key feature of that vulnerability has been flooding. And this is where the climate change comes in. So, like many countries in the developing world, we're not great emitters, but we are emitters, and the main areas are waste management and poor transportation. 
But our biggest challenge is that climate change is not something that we're concerned about in 10 years from now. It's something that's affecting us today because we're already beginning to see severe impacts of extreme weather conditions. And when you couple that with deforestation, it makes it very local and very real. So in 2014, we had a mudslide, and the image you see there is the hole in the mountain that was left when 1,000 people died in less than five minutes as literally the mountain gave way. That was an extreme event, but without us taking appropriate action, the most vulnerable continue to be most at risk of climate events. So I've given you a little flavor of some of the challenges that I walked into. Not that I didn't know about them. They're why I ran into this job. But what did we decide to do? We decided to put in place a plan, which was my campaign promise, of tackling these issues by looking at four clusters, resilience, human development, healthy city, and urban mobility. But in doing that, to take an approach which was inclusive, which was data-driven, and which brought in performance management. You'll see on the screen our vision to transform Freetown covers those four clusters which translate into 11 priority sectors. But really significantly, we only see this happening through multi-stakeholder engagement. So we brought everyone to the table. We brought social players, like I said, the community-based organizations. We brought NGOs, development partners. We brought the government, as in the central government, ministries, departments, and agencies. But we also brought the private sector. And our starting point was recognizing that for very much of the time, as far as I could see from a non-political lens, the plans at city council level had very much been bottom up. So that sounds a bit strange because we're all for bottom up, so why was that a problem? It was a problem because there was a lack of strategic input and when we talk about neighborhoods, and we talk about communities, and even as we looked at the mapping just now for Chicago, going back a number of years, it's very clear that every community has its own challenges. And that if you therefore are looking at solutions purely with the lens of one community at a time, you could end up with a very fragmented picture. And you fail then to really plan for your city in a comprehensive way, in a strategic way, which will take everyone along. So we're doing, or we've done, bottom up and top down. So bottom up started with, it, with us engaging in July to September, 15,000 people across our 322 neighborhoods in the city. We held focus groups and we presented to them a version of the sectors, the 11 priority sectors, with some adjustments for things which would make more sense for communities than they might make at the sort of big picture level. And what we got back, which is perhaps just an affirmation of what we anecdotally knew, but was important to do, because engaging communities and making sure everyone's voice is heard, even if you think you already know what they're thinking, you still need to do it because it's part of the process. So our feedback is what you see on effectively our heat map. That across all our 48 wards and 322 or so communities, we didn't have a single priority sector where there was a sense either in terms of affordability, accessibility, and availability that citizens were satisfied with service delivery from the council. So, good place to start as you're just coming into office. Nobody's happy with the council. The social contract between the state or between the city and the residents of the city was broken. And it was even more so where we had our informal settlements and there was no access to services. We then went to a high level 
sort of more technical approach. So we got the granular feedback ward by ward of what wasn't working. And that wasn't just in terms of those, the data in numbers, but also in a narrative. We then took experts from, again, from those three sectors. So still bringing communities to the table, but also technical experts, professionals in the various fields um, from private sector, MDs, et cetera. We went through a process which lasted a number of months of taking the input from the communities, but then saying to ourselves, what is our theory of change? If we're going to transform our city and we're going to tackle 11 priority sectors, and some people would argue you can't have 11 priorities. I was told that a lot. Mayor, it's got to be one or two or maximum four. <laughs> but the challenge is when you're starting with a city where everything is broken, if you want to actually see transformation, you've got to touch on all of the sectors. So we picked up everything, but then we said, okay, we set two targets max for each of our sectors. What is it that we need to do that will have the biggest impact, touch the most people, move the dial? Even if we don't go all the way, because we're realists, at least we're doing enough to make a difference. And it's the combination of action in all of those 11 sectors, from environmental management to urban planning and housing, right through to health, job creation, urban mobility. It's the combination of actions across all of those pieces that will lead to a transformed Freetown. So we concluded that exercise um, in December of 2018 and then launched in January of this year. Uh, and transform Freetown, hashtag transform Freetown, if you're tweeting, please do. <laughs> hashtag transform Freetown became our plan between, well, actually we started rolling it out pretty much since I got into office, but it'll take us through to 2022. So we now have our 19 targets across those 11 priority sectors and 37 initiatives which sit behind them. And what's really important in this discourse over the next couple of days is the importance of community in framing that, but also in delivering them. I'm not going to read out all of our targets, but I do want to highlight a number of them where community participation has been key, not just in defining, but in implementation. As a city, we're quite a small council. We're 1.2 million people population. And I understand Chicago's just under 3 million. Is that right? I was told that today. So I hope it's right. Um, and I'm betting, I don't know the numbers for Chicago, but I can tell you for a city like Zurich, because I've been chatting to the mayor of Zurich. They have a population of 450,000 people, and they have a staff of over 20,000. We have a population of 1.2 million people, and I inherited a staff of 500 people. So it begins to show you the nature of the challenge. So the challenges are external. They're also internal. In addressing or looking at how we implement, for us, getting other people on board, being inclusive, wasn't a nice to have. It was an essential, because there's no way we could do it on our own. So, I'm, with the targets are there, I'm going to move on and talk about some of those targets in the context of how they link into the SDGs. And you can see there the SDGs along the top, the, the sectors along the left-hand column. I've been involved now in a number of conversations with mayors from around the world and with the UN and the UN Habitat and other parties. Oh, and <laughs> just as if by magic, um, Penny walks in, who we just recently at Anga in September, as um, the city of Freetown, signed a commitment to be reporting on our implementation of the SDGs by, well, on an annual basis. Um, in what, what are now known as local voluntary reviews, and Penny will speak more to them 
um, when she is uh, on the platform. Why am I bringing this up? The SDGs and our 2020 global or our 2020 our 2030 global goals are not something which are abstract. I didn't start by looking at a list of SDGs and saying, how am I going to fix the problems of Freetown? I'm going to use the SDGs. No, we started off by looking at our problems, working together, as you've seen, with communities and with technical experts and with all city stakeholders, including people who just had an interest. I mean, there was somebody on the urban planning, urban mobility work group who just has a WhatsApp group where she moans all the time about traffic. So. So when we were setting up the group, I sent a text to her saying, guess what? Why don't you come and join the Urban Mobility Group so you can be part of the solution? So all sorts of people were part of designing this. Having designed it and put it, putting them then against the SDGs, what you'll then find is that everything that we're doing in Transform Freetown aligns at one level or the other with one of the SDG, one of the global goals. Importantly, also in lines with our national government plan. But now coming on to a really significant part of all of this. Great to be aligned, great to have the goals, great to have the targets, but how do you finance it? And I will say right up front, in case you didn't, you can't read the small text, red means gap. So you can see funding gaps right across the piece. But excitingly, you also see a lot of green, where because of the plans that we've laid out and the clear articulation of that, we've been able to engage partners, whether they're multilateral agencies. We put money in as a city into everything that we're doing. In some cases, central government has. But there's a blue box there, and that's community participation. So the engagement of community in terms of financing, not because they're taking money out of pocket, but really coming alongside and being part of solutions, giving of time. So let me use here now this slide to give some examples of community participation and engagement and how we are collectively as Freetonians solving our problems. So one of our, our targets within um, environmental management I'm over. It's okay. okay. <laughs> I thought I might get that. <laughs> One of our targets within environmental management has been addressing, in the short term, the challenges of flooding. So that's been a flood mitigation exercise that we started as soon as I got into office. Communities have embraced that, and they've been part of an exercise of going. They've helped us with the mapping. Um, to say these are the flood flashpoints so that we can then work with engineers to technically go through from the catchment point where the water starts right down to the sea level and unblock those. In 2018, the, I came into office in May. Rainy season starts in May. We started working on this in June. For the first time in five years, we had no floods in Freetown by implementing this. And this was done. And this was done with community ownership and community participation. In 2019, we had two flood days, but they, we had, and they were really, it was the extreme weather. So in, um, on the 2nd of August, we had 176 millimeters of rain in three hours. Um, and as a result, 4,000 people were displaced, but most of those, but the, I mean, in, really, really significantly, and everybody recognized it. The flood waters receded within three hours. And most of those people were able to go back, again, with us working with them and working with other partners. Another major contribution, or another major uh, uh, target we have is revegetating the city. We have a target to increase vegetation by 50% by 2022. We've planted 23,000 trees this year with communities, communities in are informal settlements, taking ownership of protecting those trees. And we have a target for next year of a million trees, where we have hashtag transform Freetown will now be joined by hashtag Freetown Treetown. <laughs> when it comes to urban planning, 
One of the reasons why I'm here today is because of the work that the Institute has been doing with SLURC in mapping out, and Annie was in my office um, a few months ago, in mapping out those communities. And I'm very, very excited about Rihanna's work. I absolutely need to get all of that. Um, and we are we are doing that work in terms of the urban planning. We're doing it in revenue with re revenue mobilization. We are mapping every single property in the city. All of this being done with communities at the heart of our interventions: health, sanitation. S I, I am conscious that I know I've been given some extra time, but I don't want to abuse my, my uh, um, privilege. So I will just say that if you are interested in seeing more about our work, please do look it up on fcc.gov.sl, fcc.gov.sl. So financing has come from very, a variety of places. Um, you and Habitat, Chris, you're on my list. That's in anticipation, it's yellow pending. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> and we've also, we're also working on some interesting financi financing innovations um, with municipal bonds, with Blue Peace Initiative. Technology. We have, all of us, um, particularly those of you who are coming from um, developing countries, but also, you know, just hearing more and more about Chicago and the disparities in neighborhoods, Tech can really help us leapfrog, and we're using that in Freetown. So on the board are a couple of um, examples of what we're doing with community participation and engagement, which is enabling us to address significant challenges like with our waste management. So you see our Find Me in Freetown app, and I actually got it, it's, it's right now, you, you find it by going to www.findmeinfreetown.com and wherever you are in the city, and even if you do it now, you'll, you'll still, still come up, it will tell you, show you your physical location by ward. It gives you more information about your ward counselor, your ward zones, but significantly for a city that's really tackling a significant challenge with waste management, when I came into office, only 6% of liquid waste was being collected and only 21% of solid waste. We've set ourselves a target of making sure that's 60% on both counts. But that means we've got to match suppliers to residents. So Find Me in Freetown enables you to do that. The Cleanest Zone competition also has an app. We have SMS reporting for challenges that you have as residents. So we've really been able to make good use of technology and at the same time collect really valuable data, which is important for us as we track our progress against our targets. So you see how we have overviews of dashboards. But in closing, you are here over the next couple of days to look at the challenges and the opportunities that we have around the involvement of neighborhoods in the implementation of the SDGs, in participating in the progress that needs to be made in all of our cities and rural areas as we move towards 2030 and as we move towards, or we, we are already in, this decade which is being called a defining decade in respect of climate change. In Freetown, our challenges are enormous, but we also recognize that through the work of our residents and through us creating platforms which enable collaboration externally, with institutions such as these, with multilateral organizations, but also with other cities. There's a lot of learning that we do city to city. That it is possible for us to make the difference that needs to be made in the very, very short time frame that we're all looking at now. Technology, data, financing are all key elements of us being able to deliver on the SDGs at local level. But nothing is more important than the participation of our residents, whether they're informal or formal communities. That's something that we've embraced in Freetown. And I'm, so, I'm sure it's something that you'll be talking about more. Thank you so much for giving me the platform. And I look forward to engaging with various people here beyond today. 
Um, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the deliberations. Thank you. Okay, that was wonderful. So we'll have um, a little bit of a panel discussion, and we'll open it up for all of you, so um, we can start having a conversation. But I just want to get it going, starting where you left us a little bit, which is that uh, you know, I often try to reject the idea when people describe these massive statistics about urbanization, you know, how many more people are coming to cities, how a city like yours is growing at 4 or 5% a year, that this is all a problem, right? It's, it's part of our imagination. It is also a problem sometimes, but it's part of our imagination and capacity to mobilize people to turn that into an opportunity, as you said. And so, you know, uh, I often think about this in the context of India. I see Jagan there. You know, your problem is that you have a lot of people. Your, your solution is that you have a lot of people, right? So, um, so, so this is kind of interesting, but it really asks, uh, you know, what is the nature of this path ahead? And I think your work in Freetown is, is, is very inspiring. But I'm going to put you on the spot again a little bit, if I may, which is that, you know, I often hear when I talk to people, mayors, that, you know, or people in cities that if I had a better mayor, they already have one in Freetown. <laughs> but if they had more money, which you also said, then all the problems are solved. Uh, it seems to me that's not so simple, particularly the problems and the solutions that we wanted to create. So um, I wanted to ask you and then uh, the others on the panel uh, about how is it that uh, it seems also that none of us with our skills can solve some of these problems by ourselves, right? And I think we're just assembling the networks of collaboration and of sharing resources and information that allow us to do that. But I'd like to ask you if you can think of two or three things that a community like this could understand they could be of particularly strategic assistance to a city like Freetown and that may generalize. And on the other side, for all of us also, you know, what does that mean as we create all this data, as we create standards, create these signals that may attract or reject money? How do we use this sort of power of information, the kind of things that we do in research or in technology or in nonprofits responsibly? And how do we adjust such that we create, um, uh, in some sense, the process that we are aspiring to? So, Mayor, I'm going to ask you to start, if I may, but what would you, what's your wish list if you had, you know, a few things that you would want an international community to interact with your city? Right. Um, thank you. So, we, I think I mentioned the staffing in terms of numbers, um, but it's not just a question of the numbers. It's also the question of the capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think to a large extent or to some extent, um, this problem is not unique to the developing world. But historically, local governments have been seen as second class. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, both from the perspective of the financial remuneration that's available. I mean, I, I for one, as a city mayor in Freetown, I found this out after the election, by the way. <laughs> Don't get paid. You know, I get a sitting fee, which is the equivalent of $200 a month. Oh, my gosh. Um, and, and yet, there is so much work that needs to be done at the city. So, so there are some structures which are disincentives for, for, and for quality um, candidates stepping forward into these spaces. And perception is also one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, when I said I was going to run for mayor, people were like, why? Why would you do that? And I was like, because I need to fix my city. Um, so, so that capacity deficit is one where we've been able to address it by joining the dots, by really tapping into external networks, by getting other people to do for us work that needs to be done. On my funding slide, there was one slide, there was one, um, the piece with the financing, there was a piece, that, there was a box that mentioned the mayor's delivery unit. So I created the mayor's delivery unit, which is funded by external parties. So on a really practical level, um, the work that Rihanna has done will be making use of that. And, and the, thank you. Um, and the work that others do. So that, that is on a really practical level. So mm -hmm. research, um, and the research being specific. Right. So we're working with uh, UCL. Again, it's a SLURC um, relationship with this, with this research um, center, the Sierra Leone Urban Research Center. And we've said to them, please don't just do research which is way out there, mm -hmm. some vague concept. No, make sure the research you're doing is aligned to the problems that we're trying to solve and work closely with us. So it's good for you because it means your work then gets adapted and adopted mm -hmm. and you can see where it's going. But it's also good for us because it means that resources that we don't have our own access to, mm -hmm. we can tap into through you. So I would say that would be a major 
a major contribution. Yeah, that's great. I mean, f for us, I think it's a time where we often here at the institute, at the university, and many universities, including UCL, talk about urban science, for example, which used to be something preachy, right? That uh, you know, researchers do, and then they tell people uh, or cities how to be optimal, how to be smart, right? And so forth. And uh, you know, clearly, we don't understand processes of development. We've not understood even, the, in many cases, the fundamental nature of cities in terms of their complexity. So a lot of the work I think that's happening now is has this flavor. It's both practical, but it's also closer to understanding the processes that create change. But this is very important. Uh, Rihanna, what do you think? I mean, you're right in the middle of sort of this sure. this maelstrom of possibilities, yeah. and you, I know you've thought a lot about responsibility and possibility. Yeah, very much so. And I, I would echo, I think, a lot of what the mayor said in terms of, you know, understanding where where your competitive advantages are is, mm -hmm. I guess, how I would say mm -hmm. it. Of, you know, not putting all of your time and energy into the perhaps data creation side, right? And spend, you know, tapping into folks who, like us, like many others, are creating data that could be relevant. Um, I think as well, a, a big thing for me is is going back to that idea of kind of democratizing the use of satellite imagery and, and, and some of these kind of you know buzzwords that you know are, are really abstract. I think especially for communities of well, what does it mean to me as a as a um, you know as someone living in my neighborhood to use something from space, right? And, and so I think making those connections mm -hmm. in a way that's pragmatic for people, in a way that actually touches on their individual lives is, is really powerful in terms of overcoming those obstacles. Uh, but I also think that we need to lean into more creative business models. You know, I, I look across some of the graphs that the mayor was showing of all of those very disparate stakeholders and, and the incentives that they have to, to play in, in those spaces and, and in those sectors and starting to align those incentives in ways where perhaps you know, public sector are helping generate global public goods that are, that are data assets that communities everywhere could use, or understanding where there's a hybrid, where some of the commercial interests for those you know, local uh, companies, et cetera, could be emboldened and empowered, but then in the, in the same vein, communities can tap into it too. And I think there's all sorts of examples of, of that happening, and we just need much more of it, and also to help us break down some of the SDG silos because those still persist. Right. So I think that to me, one, we'll have a panel on this uh, tomorrow, but I think the sense that data and technology is, is closer, closer and getting closer to the human experience, such that the satellite is doing something that people understand and can use, yeah. but then that they have access to, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a bit sometimes a challenge as a business that you are, but also sure. the humanitarian work that you do. I, I'm sure we'll return to that maybe okay. even in questions. But uh, Katarina, you're creating these signals, right? So uh, how do you ensure that these signals for money to flow and come into projects so, such as the ones maybe the mayor is telling us about? You know, how does that, are you sure that, you know, that, how do you adapt and create really something that goes to the intended use? Um, and can you give us an idea that there's all this money sloshing around, right? I'm blown away by when you look at, we were having this conversation yesterday, we're talking about maybe tens of trillions of dollars for global infrastructure in the next few decades having to be invested. You can unpack that, but it means several, say, billions of dollars a year in Africa and so forth. But this money exists and it's invested often in silly stuff, right? But how do we, you know, in pension funds and so forth. Can you give us an idea about the handshake and how these signals need to be created? Um, yeah, you're very right. There's a lot of money around, especially from institutional investors, uh, trillions um, that have to be invested. Um, when we talk to them, their story is always like, oh, go and find me a bankable project. <laughs> so uh, their language is, you know, uh, the project has to be bankable. But not every project is bankable. Um, it's very easy. It's, uh, as I mean, you know, most of them are not really bankable in that sense. Uh, their projects have to be there to, to give basic services to a city, and they're not bankable. So um, I think that is the challenge. Um, the other challenge is um, that institutional investors are very risk averse. Um, pension funds have to you know, be, uh, try to avoid risk, obviously. Um, so there are different, there are various ways of, of streams of money on how investors can be connected to projects. So when we talk to institution investors, we mostly would talk about you know, the asset class of infrastructure. Uh, to, to, from our perspective, that we would influence that discussion to be more sustainable and resilient. Um, then uh, on the, uh, concerning our work with um, 
sustainable impact bonds. There's a whole different group of uh, investors out there, impact investors that, that, that work with these models. And I think the a very important part is uh, that we really have to come up with innovative models uh, and blend finance. There has to be, someone has to give a guarantee for the first risk. Someone has to, the city has to chip in with a, a certain uh, uh, amount. The, there have to be new models where we really engage various stakeholders with their, uh, whatever you know, risk they can take um, and combine uh, these efforts uh, on various projects. And this can be very different in, in, in mm -hmm. different situations. From our perspective, yeah, we, we just use our ESG measuring monitoring mm -hmm. um, system to, let's say, make investors feel more comfortable <laughs> to taking that risk, being more informed about the risk, and also tell them, you know, it's all about cost reduction building, it's about cost savings, it's, um, you know, avoiding stranded assets, fossil fuel, it's, there, there are some mm -hmm. um, really good arguments on the financial, with the financial language we can use to, to get this, also climate and green investment into the municipal space. Mm -hmm. So I just want to provoke another question, which touches on everything that each one of you already said, but it's really uh, comes to the fore with some of the things that you showed us, Rihanna, mm -hmm. which is that I, I'm started to say it this way, and please disabuse me, but I think we'll know everything about space and the built environment and land in the next few years, and we'll keep on tracking it, as you already showed us, is sort of possible, and it will only improve. So if we know everything about the built environment, if you know everything about each speck of land, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Right? You know, how do we determine, for example, you know, what, whose land it is? Uh, what is public land and should be dedicated to accesses and public spaces versus what is private? Who has the right to that? Do we could create cadastral maps as we used to, or what models do we use? Um, and it would be interesting, several of you, all of you will have a different, uh, how do we track infrastructure? How do we measure risk in a project, for example, which both of you talked about. So um, l let's just do a round of talking about the possibilities mm -hmm. and responsibilities of doing that. It sounds like you're already using it and to some extent, Mayor. But then we'll open it up after that for the audience. And, uh, and so think about your question. I'm coming back to you in a second. So yeah, um, so in our context, we have a, a very real challenge, um, which is that, and this could be true, will be true of some other cities in terms of devolution, mandates, responsibilities between central government and local government. Mm -hmm. And in our case, um, according to the Local Government Act of 2004, building permits, land use planning, these are responsibilities of the city. But for the last 15 years, the central government has held on to them, mm -hmm. um, which is why there has been no planning, because central government really cannot plan for cities. Um, we're in the process, the, 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 there's been a new administration they announced in March that that function would come to the city. It's now end of October, hasn't happened. Um, but we, we're, we continue to push and, and I've actually just taken the view that I will legally challenge the government if, we don't, if they don't you know, sort of release those functions to us because urban planning is fundamental, fundamental absolutely to being able to improve the lives of our residents, to be able to ensure that people have access to facilities without the urban planning and the urban move, the whole package, then seeing the pictures, seeing the built environment gets you nowhere. Right. What you've got to do is plan it. And in, in, you know, even where you have a situation like ours where you're, you're retrofitting, you're, you're trying to improve, you've got to draw the line at some point and say, okay, we've got very practical things that we need to do. Um, in formal communities that are in very vulnerable places, we have to have those difficult conversations mm -hmm. um, about moving. You know, when we had the, the rain on the 2nd of August, I had a meeting with the Slum Dwellers Association that during the day, you know, they came into my office because we had communities, those that were flooded, were the same ones that have been flooded year after year. And it's like, there's a pattern here. Mm -hmm. We know it, you know it. All the data is showing us this. So what are we going to do? So we're now actually working on a program. We pulled together a consortium of NGOs. Um, and we're, we're, we're working with the um, SDI Association. 
and we're saying, we're going to do this carefully. We're looking at a program of, I don't want to use the word relocation, because like with, I don't know if everybody has the same uh, uh, motto, but in, in Freetown, it's relocate where possible. I uh, know, upgrade where possible, we relocate where necessary. So we're doing some relocation, we're doing some upgrade, but we're not doing it with drama. Mm -hmm. There's no big announcement being made. There's no press release of government saying everybody needs to move. No, we're working together sensitively. We're doing surveys. We're trying to understand where people come from, whether they're first generation, second generation, or just been here in the last six months. And then we're working on a plan where it's almost with a, like a case management assigned to each family. So we look at what works for you. And then we're going to work with my counterparts in other areas in pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. That is what everybody is, the journey everybody is on. So access to schools, healthcare, jobs, mm -hmm. how do we do that? How do we help you access those whilst helping you also move away from areas where your life is at risk, services can't be delivered to you, and it just costs the city more without us getting anywhere. So with the pictures, with this imaging, what we've got to be able to do is to plan, mm -hmm. to plan better, to plan in an integrated way, to be able to tap into the resources. And use, like you said, there are many projects which we need to do which are not bankable because infrastructure typically is not, doesn't pay mm -hmm. in the same way as an investment in some agriculture project will do. And that's why the blended financing needs to, to be there. That's why the funding um, needs to be more directed at city level so it can be more effective. When, when, when I say funding, I mean multilateral donor funding. So we're getting more bang for our buck because there's been a lot of money spent which right. hasn't gone very far when you really look at the impact on communities. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so many things to touch on in terms <laughs> yeah. of all of that. But I think in terms of kind of the question around responsibility, you know, I think we, not every country has its own constellation of satellites. Uh, not every country wants to have its own constellation, or can, right, for, for many reasons. And so I think that, you know, the, the kind of power dynamics there and the, I think, also the ethical responsibility um, that a lot of satellite imagery providers and other data providers feel to really push our technology to the limits of not just our core business interests, but also where where is some of that value? and. And I think it's 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 a journey for for many of us in terms of one, it's it's such new territory to understand how data could be used in a context like resilient climate resiliency and things like that because more often you know our customer bases are are very different, and so I think it's about kind of breaking the mold. It's it's about understanding new partnerships because the reality is our data are super boring unless we have folks that are putting it to mm -hmm. good use, right? So. Um, and, and I think, again, just to go back to that kind of soundbite from our founder about kind of getting our data out of jail, it's so important because otherwise we're just, you know, collecting, collecting petabytes of, of information for nothing. And so I think one, you know, closer partnerships and, and, and also kind of iterating, but then from our standpoint, understanding how far you go along that data value chain, right? So we're, we're not trying to solve for all of the downstream problems. We're trying to focus on what we do really well, and then hopefully, uh, as much as we can through data licensing and, and other mechanisms, make those insights, those information available to folks who could really use it. So for us, you know, we're focusing on things like extracting those data and to be able to do it better, faster, cheaper, of course, but then also um, what are the models in which we can make the data more available to folks, folks who have limited connectivity, folks who perhaps um, don't have backgrounds in data science or remote sensing to the, to the kind of capacity and skills discussion earlier. And then also I think it begs the question of how can we then support when those data are available, is there a role for private sector also to play in terms of helping build capacity? Uh, because really for us, there's a great interest there. That's our next generation of users. Um, so I think it behooves us to, to find those places where, where we can kind of run faster together. Great. Do you want to add some thoughts about how that kind of information helps? Yeah, maybe and just touching on a project we did with Slum Dollars International in Durban, which was a very um, a great experience for us uh, as we got to know the Know Your City data. And I think in, in that sense, as we as you know, data is power. And uh, um, it was a great experience as we, we tried to 
um, overlay the Know Your City data with our uh, SURE standard to get a better understanding of, of uh, three slums. And what was amazing there is that we could actually channel data uh, to provide a certain information to the mayor then uh, and, and interlink with the resilience planning of the city. So it was a very inter interesting experience on how to um, channel data also and filter it according to sustainable principles and translate it then hopefully into action. But it was a very small project, so we don't know where the action went exactly at the moment. But it was a, a great experience of, of, of interlinking data on different levels. Well, great. So I think I'm going to turn it out to the audience, uh, if you don't mind. We have sort of somewhat uh, awkward format. We can bring a microphone to you, but there are two sitting here uh, in front. Uh, and so if you don't mind standing up to them and asking a question, I ask you that you reflect a little bit on what we're trying to do with the panel, which of course you can direct a question to any of the speakers, but also sort of thinking about a framework in which all these ingredients are coming together to generate a picture of uh, global development that has local roots and how might we do that together. Uh, so I see Don already ready to ask a question, so uh, please go ahead, Don. Okay, thank you. I introduce Don, yourselves if you yeah, don't mind. I'm Don Webbles, uh, University of Illinois. Um, I was wondering about climate resilience, and particularly I was thinking of the mayor, but I think it could go across the entire panel, in terms of as you look at the future of cities, to what degree are you considering uh, the changes in climate, not just warming, which is itself important, but the changes in severe weather like you talked about before. Severe precipitation is becoming more common and expected to continue. Um, and sea level rise for a city like Freetown is also extremely important. So um, just wondering to what degree that was included in your planning as you're looking forward. Would you like to answer? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and it was included, had to be. Um, so with, like you say, the, it, for, in our context, it's about resilience. It's about adaptation. So one of the big projects, and this, is, this question of bankability becomes really relevant to that, is the need for stormwater infrastructure. So the flooding is created not just because um, of blocked drains and culverts, but also because there is inadequate stormwater infrastructure. Um, so when you, when you, in order for you to address the massive erosion, you're planting the trees. But you also need to have, because of this extreme weather, you need to have investment. So we are working on a project, um, the, the, the municipal bond that, that I mentioned, the, the use of that funding will be um, to put in place um, for flood water, um, stormwater infrastructure. Um, along that, that's really dealing with mountains and uh, along the coast. We also have a challenge with the rising sea level. Um, and the, the conversation I, I just had about upgrades and relocation speaks to that. But we're also embarking on a massive um, re-establishment of mangrove swamps um, to reintroduce or re to help our biodiversity, which, which is also about adaptation, because the erosion that's going on along the coast will be helped um, by the reestablishment of mangroves where you can have them. So in, in, in a lot of what we're doing, we're, we're having to, to build that in. A big driver, well, let me not say a big driver, a factor of, of the rapid urbanization is also linked or also has um, um, links to climate with extreme weather impacting agriculture. And so more people leaving agriculture and coming to the city. So the, the, the impacts of climate change are many and varied. And, and so just that question of planning to absorb additional residents in the city itself is adaptation. And these are the places where, these are the challenges where funding is so difficult. Because you know, affordable housing for um, internal migrants is not a bankable project. Not easily, anyway. But these are the solutions that we're having to find. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on any of that? Or we, OK, just. Uh... Um, yeah, in, 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 um, in the short standard, we have uh, a lot of criteria on adaptation and resilience. And I think, as you, as you said, the whole topic of nature-based solutions uh, is really coming up. And it, it, it uh, provides so many solutions exactly in that context. Uh, context. Um, 
and it makes us and and I think there are also upcoming uh, financing models uh, which are connected to resilience factors. Right. So I think that's a very interesting point, right? But it also raises an interesting uh, also change in perspective in that, for example, we discussed nature-based solutions in Chicago, and you haven't seen the cold just yet, right? But it's going to hit. It's very different, I think, from the climate in Freetown and what nature does in different contexts, right? Mm -hmm. So it does require sort of a much more sophisticated view of the integration between human activity and resources in urban environments and nature at the interface that's dynamical on both sides. So that's very important in so, uh, an area still very much being developed. But uh, there's a question over here. Yeah. Hello. Sorry about the podium. I'm here. <laughs> um, I'm Robert Crump, first year student at, at Harris Public Policy across the street. Um, I'm curious if, if y'all could reflect uh, on, on uh, behavioral economics and how that informs um, urban policy. Sometimes you can get a great project, great idea, you get the funding, you get the buy-in, you build it, and the community impact is less than what you expect, or it's a negative return. How, how can you collect behavioral data, data, and how can you best apply it to uh, produce the best outcomes for, for the, intended, uh, the intended outcome? Thank you. The behavioral data. Um, does anyone want to jump in on that? Uh, do you have any experience you want to share? Um, OK. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, a lot of things to maybe tease out there uh, from a behavioral standpoint. I think, again, it's about thinking about not just behavioral data, but how can we think about that with other types of data? Uh, because inevitably, then we'll learn much more. Um, I think it's to the point, you know, a lot of the different data types that we've talked about. Plus, I think it, you know, it understands, helps us can understand more of the dynamics, right, in terms of the drivers behind um, what, we're, what we're observing. Um, and, yeah, I, I think as well in terms of your earlier question around kind of macroeconomics and, and that, um, same thing in terms of be, the, the scales at which we work, being able to kind of interchange as much as we can. And, and, and granted, that's, that's not for, for every analysis and every use case, that's, that's not possible. Um, but I think moving towards that more is, is where we need to be and, and, and thinking about things at scale, but at, at re, really detailed levels and, and with context, of course. If I understood your question correctly. He's there He's now. There. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <He moved. laughs> if I understood your question correctly, um, it's, it's how do you ensure that when you're making your investments, um, they actually get utilized by those for whom you want the investments, and you're saying, where does data fall into that? So I think it's um, it's data, but it's also it's we can very easily think of residents, think of people as data, um, and I think that's you've got to be really careful with that. So it's not just a question of getting data; it's a question of actually getting buy-in getting participation, but in addition to that, it's understanding that there's nothing that you do that sits in a silo. Let me give you an example of our sanitation problem. So I mentioned already the statistics, 20% solid, 21% solid waste, 6% liquid waste, and that's because waste management as a system broke down. You know, the waste management infrastructure collection, disposal, all of that broke down during the war and it never got fixed again. So you have, you have now some, the war ended in 2001 and it broke down earlier. You have now some 20 years plus of there not being a system. So what do human beings do? Whatever is easiest for them. So you get illegal dumping in the sea, you get people burning, everybody just makes up their own rules. And ultimately it's probably what costs them least if not nothing. So if you come in now and you say, you want to change that. You're, you want to put in a system. In bringing in a new waste management system, you need to go right the way along the value chain, starting at behavior. And you need to appreciate that you don't just engage them in terms of the data that says only 6%, but also the fact that people had no infrastructure. So if you're going to get them to change their behavior, you have to incentivize them, but you also have to provide the infrastructure, and you've got to do some monitoring and some enforcement. So yes, 
and he's laughing because it, seriously because if you say to somebody um, okay you need to pay to have your waste collected and they've been dumping illegally and no one stopped them why would they pay to have their waste collected you know when you tell people stop smoking how many people do you know who smoke and we all know it kills you right but people still do it because that's human nature so I think it's taking that joined up piece so in, in Freetown, what we've done in, uh, um, is we've introduced a cleanest zone competition. So there's carrot and stick. In addition to having the infrastructure where you've got on your, on your app, and not everybody has access to an app, we also recognize that. So it's also on notice boards around the city. Um, in addition to be able to identify everybody, we put in legislation, we made it compulsory. If you're collecting waste, you need to be registered with the city. If, you, if you're not registered with the city, you're committing a crime. You know, and you need to meet certain best practice. The competition gives you, at community level, investments. If your community wins, and we had the first one in April, and it was a red carpet affair, and was pub, you know, on TV, we had the most sort of famous presenter do the award, that community gets all of that, but they also get 250 meters of paved road made from recycled plastic. They get 10 solar street lights. They get 10,000 litres of water point, and they get 10 scholarships for children. So all of a sudden, there's an incentive to change behaviour. But that's not good enough. You still need to go door to door <laughs> and have inspections. So it's, it's putting the whole piece together. And I think that's, and of course, the infrastructure on the other end. So we're closing the dump sites. We're building landfills. Uh, landfills are a bad thing, but we still need them because we don't even have those. So we're moving from dump sites to engineered landfills with recycling and wastewater treatment. So it's a whole chain. But I guess the piece I wanted to just land on, it's not just looking at data. It's engaging with people. Great. So uh, that's human ecology. There you go. It's how you build it. Uh, and so, but to the point about uh, behavioral economics, I think we're at a time where we are psycho social psychology much more generally. It, we're really at a time where it has to come out of the lab and has to be interacting with process of development on the ground like this. I find immensely uh, inspiring examples from Freetown, as you just described, but from cities uh, that, that have to create uh, gradual solutions uh, in Africa, in uh, Latin America, Colombia is famous for that and so forth. So there are lots of interesting examples where these worlds meet and should meet more closely. Benji, so good to have you. Uh, Benj, uh, uh, hi, panel. Benji de la Pena from City of Seattle, and I'm conscious I'm the third male to ask a question, so I apologize. <laughs> Ninja first. Um, uh, but related to the previous question, right? So we've got satellite sensing, GIS. They're usually about objects. And you mentioned, Luis, even in your, that it's about the human ecology and the human scale and even your own previous research in Santa Fe Institute about cities being social reactors, how do we then find out and map human social networks, which even in Chicago's own experience uh, in its heat wave, when Eric Kleinenberg's work, that isolation and disconnection from the community uh, leads to death, right, in, in emergency situations. So how do we find out and what are we gathering about human networks in our cities and the power those human networks have and that's human resilience at that scale. Is there any data that we can gather? Yeah, it's much harder. Do, would you like to jump in? But it's much, much more important too. Yeah, um, in terms of kind of the, the human piece of that, I think there's um, a lot of different data sets that, that can provide a, a lot of interesting insights potentially. Um, again, they're not a panacea, but um, social media, I think, offers really interesting insights from uh, understanding human networks and understanding kind of how those play out uh, in the physical world. Um, I also think, though, some of the work that we've done, the early work around using um, call detail records and things like that, just to understand where, where, where are people going, right? Um, a lot of times we just don't know that. And what time of day are they going and, and what kinds of people? And, and we can start to disaggregate based on all sorts of all sorts of things besides gender is, is what I mentioned in the case of Santiago. So I think there's, there's all of those kind of rich data sets that we could leverage to, to understand that. Um, but I also think there's the kind of, you know, from a non-tech standpoint, I think there's also the, the local perspective, of course, too, and, and, and that shouldn't get lost. Yeah, so, uh, you know, just to add a little bit to that, as you, as Rhiannon just said, on the one hand, you have extraordinary sets of data that we all have a mobile device, 
and you can know people's location and infer to a large extent use of public spaces, uh, access to different parts of the city, and the people they're likely to meet, and so forth. So there, there's elements of that that are coming straight up from technology and have, at least as an entry point, uh, uh, that flavor. But I think a lot of the work that's been done both in community organization, by anthropologists, by social, other social scientists about understanding what those networks do for people, how they change with whether people get services and kinds of environments where they live. Uh, that's fundamental and it's lagging a little bit, these technological possibilities, and so it's an area that is very important. But also to the point that uh, the data, I always say this, data is not the solution, right? So data tells you what has happened in the past, but to your question, I think you're asking questions also about resilience, and we're asking questions more generally about the future. And in many ways, we have to have an understanding that helps us think how these networks will play out in a model where our cities will be you know, more sustainable and better for people. So uh, another question, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Morris Levinson. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the economics department here. I study economic geography and a uh, major concept or something I'm very interested in is this issue of path dependence, the way in which decisions we've made in the past, particularly with regards to things, you know, durable things like urban infrastructure, uh, shape or constrain the choices available to us today. So, um, I, for all of you, you're facing a, well, we're all facing a, opportunities to shape future development, but also a challenge in adjusting uh, in a constrained sense, given what we've already done in the past. And I was just wondering if you could offer some perspective on how you weigh uh, those two uh, sort of paths for shaping urban development. Mm -hmm. So the issue of lock-in and the future consequences of the choices we make now as well. Right, and how you, how you think about whether to focus on adjusting things that already exist versus trying to make policies to shape development that has mm -hmm. not yet been realized. Right. Yeah, um, really good question, and um, it's the real life challenge. So if I come back to our urban planning um, situation, and I wish I had a, an image of Freetown to show you, um, you have a city which wasn't planned, so you're locked in to a certain extent now, and um, space is a real, of a real premium. There's, of the 48 wards in the city, there's only one ward where there's actually any possibility now of actually developing a local area plan because there's some space still um, that could be planned and that's the last waters you are leaving the city. The rest of it is spilling over, um, informal settlements, um, lack of zoning, industrial mixed with, you know, commercial mixed with residential. It's a, it's a little bit of a mess from an urban planning design perspective. So your question of you're locked in, what do you spend your effort doing? So we made a decision, I think it was an obvious decision, that in developing building regulations and a building permit system, we wouldn't be doing it retrospectively. There's just nothing you can do. But you would be doing it um, with a view to any additional development now needs to meet this criteria. Um, and in certain circumstances, um, particularly where you've got infrastructure, you've got buildings, mainly domestic buildings, in hazard prone areas where someone is blocking a waterway or something, then we will be, you know, the, there is a, there's a specific criteria where there will be a need to engage um, and say, no, you, you actually, we, this is dangerous, this can no longer be here. So it's, it's not easy, um, and I think that's the, that's the short answer to your question, how do you do it with difficulty? Um, but in certain situations, locked in is locked in. Um, you, you can't, it's, it's very hard. The, the resources it will take, the public outcry, the political challenges, you know, are such that your focus, in our case certainly, your focus is better spent on trying to ensure that you can go forward in a way. And you can, you can also try to create neighborhoods, uh, oases of improvement, which then act as an inspiration. Mm -hmm. With the density of population as high as ours, it's very hard to find space 
for green in an area called Aberdeen, which has the biggest roundabout, um, which actually is probably about four times the size of this room. And it, it sits in the middle of a hotel, an area where there are hotels. And I, I hesitate to say the hotel district because that makes it sound so glamorous. And, and, <laughs> and, and it needs some tidying up. Um, but it has amazing potential because if I haven't said it yet, let me say it now, Freetown is beautiful. <laughs> Those of you who've been there, it's really beautiful. And, and, and we just need to just bring out that inner beauty so it shines a bit more. So we have this roundabout. And I had made a commitment to creating green spaces. It was being used by traders. It was being used as a car park. It was being used as a rubbish dump. And the people around just did not understand why I wanted to change the status quo. It was a battle. But eventually, through community engagement, through talking to people, even though they tried to mob me the first time I went there, <laughs> Um, we, you know, we, we got a 3D design done. Mm -hmm. We had a community meeting. We showed them on a screen what it would look like and spoke to them about what it would mean if we could generate more tourist visits, footfall there. We won them over. We gave them the jobs to work with the landscape designer. And today, that space is now green. You know, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and it will become more beautiful as the flowers bloom, etc. There's some stuff you, you challenge. There's some stuff you take on. You don't give up and say, it's already there, we do nothing. But you've got to pick your battles. You've got to do the things which are doable um, and then focus then. And also because I mentioned that because of inspiration, when people see that, they go, oh, oh, well, I don't mind if we do it over there. We'll move our stuff. You know, um, but of course, it's, it's negotiation, it's engagement, it's a lot of um, bringing people along. And that's really, I, I say again, I think a real part of um, being able to be, have transformation is being inclusive. It's really recognizing that people are people, you know, and you need to give them the time and give them the respect and give them the engagement in order for you to expect them, you know, to be part of the, the journeys that you're, you are going on as a city authority. Katerina, you wanted to add some, some yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, fr from a, a sure standard perspective, what we try to do uh, to certify projects that are not, you know, that are going to have a future perspective without locking in, without having too, uh, too much CO2 emissions, that is one path for newly developed projects. And I think this uh, also caters more um, um, to low-income countries where there's a, a, a bigger need of infrastructure still. But I think we should have to, uh, uh, there's a different situation in, let's say, in the US, for example, as I think there's a lot of infrastructure in place, in place which, which already has locked in a lot of uh, bad, uh, or has a bad pathway. So I'm, I'm sometimes even thinking maybe some infrastructure has to be, you know, taken off uh, or closed down to open up for new ideas of transport, for example. Um, and a third way would be if there's a retrofit of an infrastructure to use that moment to uh, retrofit the infrastructure in a certain way that it has a future perspective and actually really answers the needs we, we have in the future. So I think it's three things. Either just don't build the infrastructure. Uh, there are certain infrastructure which should not be built. Uh, we have that a discussion in Switzerland now where we do a project on, on um, how infrastructure actually can provide sustainable lifestyles. So some inf there sh should be decision-making processes that some kinds of infrastructure just not built because they would add to the uh, lock-in effect. And then the second would be plan infrastructure in a way that it's future-proof. And the third one would be if there's a chance to, to, to come in and change the infrastructure that has been built, uh, do it at that moment and change the pathway. That would be my right. answer. Thank you, Katarina. So I, I think we're running out of time for the panel, but this is just the beginning. I see that we're more questions, but you know, uh, we'll be together for the next couple of days. So do channel those questions via the uh, media we provided, but also to each other, just meet each other in the spirit right, of talking to each other, learning from each other, and collaborations that we hope this will, uh, uh, this will generate. Um, so lunch is served, so we encourage you now to take a break. Uh, uh, the bathrooms, as we said, are downstairs. You have to go through the lobby. 
Lunch is served at 12 noon. We'll come back. So it's a very short break. But uh, we'll have, uh, we'll welcome uh, uh, Penny uh, Abi Wardina, New York City's Commissioner for International Affairs. Welcome. And she'll be after Freetown, and you've heard from the mayor about the Voluntary Local Review, we'll have New York City. And these two cities have actually been pioneering in this process of aligning their own sustainable development with the international agenda. And uh, we thought it would be a beautiful contrast, but also compliment to hear from both places. So enjoy your lunch, and uh, let's start again at 12. Thank you.